You are a Saudi, he's or she is a Saudi means you belong to that family. Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship managed by a democracy. We're really talking about a core group of maybe 15 to 30 princes that are really controlling the final decision on everything. A kingdom the size of Western Europe with a quarter of the world's known oil deposits, riches that could tip the balance of global history. But with an increasingly radical populace and a resource that won't last forever, is the sun setting on the House of Saud. It's a remarkable family in that it's held on to a fairly fragile country. They all know their survival depend upon staying together and staying in power. Each day brings further evidence that the ways we use energy strengthen our adversaries and threaten our planet. Western leaders point to Middle Eastern oil as one of the most pressing problems facing their countries. And to many, one nation is synonymous with foreign oil, Saudi Arabia. It was called the day the West woke up. The fact that 15 of the 19 terrorists on September 11, 2001 were Saudi nationals surprised some. Saudi Arabia has been a close ally of both Europe and the United States, but this seemingly worldly group of princes and kings has had a long-lasting alliance with a branch of Islam that has little fondness for the West. The Saudi royal family funded the extremists for years. I mean, we're talking about going back to the 30s, and back to independence. So these people really control the media. Today. And uh, therefore, they, and they control the schools, and they have great access to propagating their ideas. In 2005, the country crowned a new monarch, King Abdullah. He promised a new era of reforms. Our opinion inside the CIA was that Abdallah was more capable than many of the other princes. I mean, he is, this is good news for Saudi Arabia. He's making an alliance more with the liberals in order to push the kingdom in the 21st century. A delicate balance, but some fear the fundamentalists in Saudi Arabia may turn and bite the hand that feeds them. Saudi Arabia finally woke up and said to itself, if we continue to support radical factions, extremist Wahhabi factions, we ourselves are going to collapse. The dynasty ruling Saudi Arabia traces its roots to a desert past and to a visionary tribal leader from the mid-18th century. Mohammed bin Saud went to rule the country and the tribes uh, of Arabia, the majority of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. They formed an alliance where, where the Wahhabis or Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab will be in charge of religion. The Wahhabists follow the teachings of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. A Wahhab and his followers reviled other religions and especially adherence to other branches of Islam, like the Shia, who honor figures other than the original prophet, Muhammad. Abdel Wahab felt that Islam had strayed from its true beliefs, so he wanted to go back to the original beliefs of the Quran and what had been taught by Muhammad. The Wahhabis are a very strongly missionary oriented sect. They believe that Wahhabi Islam is, will save Islam. They had this fierce religious ideology, the willingness on the part of the Ikhwan, the Brotherhood as they were called, to die in battle almost a willingness, a wish, to die in battle. With the help of the puritanical Wahhabist holy warriors, the Saud clan conquered land throughout the Arabian Peninsula. In 1924, five generations later, Abdulaziz bin Rahman al-Saud, also known as Ibn Saud, finally took over the holiest sites in Islam Mecca and Medina. 
Ibn Saud is often seen as an Arabian Lawrence of Arabia, but he was better than Lawrence because he actually fought. Very tall, very big, uh, had a lot of charisma and a lot of guts. I mean, he did a lot of, you know, attacks in the middle of the night, completely desperate type of military attacks of other positions, which no one would have done. I mean, he was a man, a man of great courage. He united the area's warring Bedouin tribes through both violence and intricate alliances. Talking around the campfires, the Bedouin liked to joke about Ibn Saud. They said he's got two swords, a sword of steel, the one with which he conquered, and the sword of flesh, which he used once he'd conquered and would marry the chief daughters of the tribe that he'd conquered and thus bring that tribe physically into the, the union of the Saudi family. In 1932, he proclaimed this conglomeration of tribes between the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf his family's kingdom, Saudi Arabia, the Arabia of the Sauds. This patriarch and his 45 sons would rule into the next century in partnership with his religious allies. Wahhabi clerics were given wide control of the educational and legal systems. In the early 20s, Abdullah sees Al Saud uh, was able to really take the ideology of Wahhabism, and we might consider today that's the ideology of, of militant Islam, and uh, to really make it into a political force in order to pull the tribes of Saudi Arabia together. And it's an Islam that we look at is abhorrent because it involves cutting people's heads off, uh, you know, enslaving women and on and on and on, all of the, you know, the popular cliches we know about. The kingdom survived, largely from revenues charged to the Muslims from around the world who make the annual pilgrimage, or Hajj, to Saudi Arabia's holy sites. He charged Muslims to make the Hajj to Mecca. They had to pay a fee to be allowed into Saudi Arabia, and that's how he lived, frugally. But then, in the midst of the Great Depression, a new source of revenue presented itself, one that would change world history. Oil had been found in nearby Iraq, Iran, and Bahrain. He was able to, uh, to, to have the vision to know what he did not know. He knew that he did not know anything about oil, so he was not going to go look for it himself. He knew it existed, he knew he could bring a lot of money to the kingdom, so he hired the oil company of Southern California, SoCal, to look for oil, and eventually it took them a long time, but they found oil. This precursor to today's Saudi oil behemoth, Aramco, gave the king $170,000 for the rights to drill. A drop compared to the many billions that the resource would one day produce for the royal family. This was a personal license to drill oil that Ibn Saud had granted in his lands. It was his money. And to this day, uh, there is a sense in which the House of Saud considered the oil to be their own personal property. Along with news of our fuel oil shortages comes the fresh warning that our known oil reserves will be exhausted in 10 years at the current rate. Toward the end of World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt recognized the importance of Saudi oil to the United States and invited the king aboard the USS Quincy to officially open diplomatic relations between the countries. The desert monarch and the patrician from New York seemed to be so different, but Roosevelt scored points when he gave the aging warrior king his spare wheelchair. American firms have opened new fields abroad. Of these, one of the biggest and most important is Saudi Arabia. Beneath its blistering sands lies an... With global shipping now safe again and a major customer secured, oil production resumed, and so did the flow of money. The king wanted to modernize, no small feat when his ideological partners, the Wahhabis, outlawed innovations developed after the time of Muhammad. He wanted to attain modernity for his people while keeping his society as it was in the earliest days of Islam. This is a tall order, but it's a formula that he perfected 
and that enabled Saudi Arabia to maintain its puritanical religion and at the same time accept modernity that has come through to this day, I believe. And I think that was amazingly, it showed amazing vision on his part. Ibn Saud arranged a special demonstration of how the phone could work. And he had it call up a distant town. And he said to one religious sheikh, well, why don't you speak on the phone and see what you can hear at the other end? And at the other end, Ibn Saud had stationed another religious sheikh. And so when the religious saw that this work of the devil could in fact be used to, to make their own communications easier, they changed their mind. As the battle-scarred king aged and his severe arthritis increased, his kingdom seemed poised for either great wealth or oblivion. By the early 1950s, people around the world wondered, could the new nation last longer than its charismatic founder? Who would be the next king? The system of succession in Europe, uh, in royalty, it tends to go from father to son. And if there's no son, we name a woman and then you have a queen. The, it, it, it doesn't work like this in a Bedouin system. In a Bedouin system, the, the family gets together and tries to find out who the most important leader is. Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship managed by a democracy. In other words, the royal family works solely by consensus. And any decision in the royal family has to be okayed by everyone. With the wrong successor, the fledgling country's vast wealth could be squandered, and the kingdom could quickly return to its desert roots. The kingdom of Saudi Arabia was propelled from a group of desert tribes to a modern nation. This happened in just a few decades at the hands of its founding king, known in the West as Ibn Saud. But in his waning years, Ibn Saud faced a problem. In the last years of his life, Ibn Saud relied very strongly on his two eldest surviving sons, Saud and Faisal. But most people who knew the two brothers knew that the second brother, Faisal, was the one who really had it in his head, the one who had the political ability. And so, before he died, Ibn Saud is said to have brought the two brothers together and asked that although one would obviously become king, that was Saud, and the younger one, Faisal, would become crown prince, they should see themselves as a partnership and should work as a team. On November 9, 1953, the warrior who established Saudi Arabia died in his son Faisal's arms. But Faisal was not the heir to the throne. I don't know why Saud was chosen over Faisal, probably because he was more senior and had therefore more of a following in the rest of the family and was probably more of a unifier into the family. Uh, but he did not do well because he spent too much money too quickly and he brought the kingdom to bankruptcy basically. The new king, Saud, eventually built 10 palaces and in one year ran up five million dollars in food bills alone. He gave solid gold watches to visitors, watches sporting his own portrait. They became known as Mickey Sauds. Saud was known as a, a mismanager. He was not what we would call a successful manager by modern standards. Uh, the country ran into huge deficits. Uh, he had a reputation for being more interested in the leisurely lifestyle than in the running uh, of, uh, of a country. Saud's extravagance even extended to his personal life. He had 52 sons and 55 daughters. Saud's brothers were concerned about the hemorrhaging budget, and their Wahhabi Muslim partners were concerned with his relationship with Egypt's Gamal Nasser, a proponent of socialism. Would the royal family council try to undo the will of the patriarch king? Would there be a coup d'etat? They were worried about Arab socialism. And they were worried about Nasser's connections with the Soviet Union. The Saudis are deeply religious, consider communism, generally speaking, as atheism. U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower courted the king 
in an effort to shift the balance of power away from the Soviet Union with the help of his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. Eisenhower and Dulles had the idea for a time that Saud, representing the Saudi state, which was receiving more and more oil income, might be a useful counter to Nasser in the Arab world. Saud favored Eisenhower's economic aid over Nasser's movement, but the cash infusion wasn't enough. The family council moved to sideline Saud and put the crown prince, his brother Faisal, in charge of day-to-day -day affairs, a huge embarrassment to a sitting monarch. King Saud tried to regain power, but the deficits continued. He was declared unfit to rule and exiled to Greece in 1964. Even who the king is, is defined by the family. You know, you have to be very, very subtle and very careful on how you work this out if you want to maintain yourself in power. He simply was not up to running a country that was rapidly moving from the 7th century into the 20th century. The skills, the sensitivities, the sophistication, the administrative skills, he just didn't possess. He was a rather tragic figure. It was Saudi Arabia's bloodless coup. The deposed king died in 1969. King Faisal had already been the country's leader for years. President Kennedy supposedly said to Faisal, Your Majesty, you're going to deny this, but there are slaves in your country, and I want them freed. And they were freed as a result of this meeting. Personality-wise, they were so different. Intellectually, they were so different. Saud, the last thing one would ever have said about him was that he was an intellectual. That wasn't his interest. Faisal was very well read, paid attention to all kinds of things. He was, he was a very wise, able man. An austere figure with a surprising past. I understand that when he was a young man, he was a bit of a libertine at times. Uh, I can't say how much or just where, but that was what the stories were. In his youth, Faisal was known to live the high life, even on a humble picnic with friends. Oh, that was hysterical. That really was hysterical. And we, we prepared uh, beef hot dogs and, uh, and uh, all the fixings for any picnic. And we went to the park in limousines yet. <laughs> and I'll never forget Prince Faisal got a hot dog bun, put the hot dog, and uh, caviar and oil saw on top of it. This was a trend that would be repeated again. Princes who break Islamic laws by drinking and carousing, who later become devout kings. Faisal soon became one of the most popular monarchs the region had ever known. King Faisal, I, I think you could almost call him the idealized king. He was tall, he was very distinguished looking, much more educated and worldly than any of the predecessors. This popularity meant that Faisal was able to launch ambitious plans to modernize the country. He built hospitals, schools, and initiated massive irrigation projects. Faisal, more than any other king in the kingdom, is the person who actually propelled the kingdom into the modern era. The man would work 12 to 14 hours a day, receiving petitions, seeing foreign diplomats, meeting with his cabinet. So he was unlike any other uh, Saudi ruler I have known. He was a creature of work. He was the cleverest king they ever had. And in some ways, revolutionary. And I'll give you an example. Girls schools didn't exist until Faisal became king. And when he opened the first one, there were a lot of protests from the ulamas and everybody else. They wanted to tear it down, and he stood his crown and got away with it. One advance didn't go over well with the hardline Wahhabi clerics and their followers, the introduction of television. It was a hard pill to swallow for those who opposed any innovation after the time of Muhammad. 
there were actual demonstrations against this wicked Western invention that would bring these ghastly soap operas showing the decadence of the West into the Holy Land. King Faisal insisted that this was uh, an innovation which, under control, could actually enhance education and, and pushed it through. One of Faisal's own nephews was killed during the ensuing skirmishes. There were riots in the streets and, and uh, one of the young men who was rioting was a prince and was killed by the riot police. But through his own example of piety and Bedouin tradition, he seemed to keep the extremists at bay. With his modernizations in place, he was able to wrest controlling interest of the country's oil company, Aramco, from Westerners. Saudis started to run uh, the oil fields. It was this, the great national asset, that Faisal felt that the Saudis should take control of themselves. It jerked Saudi Arabia out of this medieval past and threw them onto the center of the world stage because they were producing so much oil, so much money was coming in that they had to spend this money in order to keep the international economy going. A further break with the West came when Israel's neighbors attacked her during 1973's Yom Kippur War, and the U.S. sided against the Arab nations. He felt very deeply about Israel, very strongly about that. He always insisted he was not anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, but he was anti-Israel. Having gotten this message that we're going to be even-handed, and two days later saying, and we're going to give $2 billion to the Israelis for military aid, was a breach of trust, personally. And it was at that point that something in Faisal snapped, and he gave way to a very strong feeling that was generated by those around him, that the power of oil held by the Arabs should actually be used in this war. As a leader in the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, he called for an oil embargo. Faisal made his oil minister, Sheikh Yamani, a household name throughout the world, as the Saudis seemed to be in direct control of the flow of gasoline. It was the only card he had to play. It was the only weapon he had in his arsenal that he thought would make a, an impact on, on America. Now, it did make a big economic impact on America, but it certainly didn't change American policy. Relations were damaged and revenues were down, but Faisal had become one of the most powerful leaders the Arab world had ever seen. But had his effort to modernize gone too far, too fast? The decision to introduce television to the kingdom came back to haunt him. On March 25, 1975, the brother of the young nephew killed in the television riots was admitted for an audience with the king. And when he his turn to greet Faisal, he pulled his gun and, and, and blast his brain. I was so, so horrified, I still am, to, to think a man of that caliber, a man of that dream, a man of that uh, desire to make things better, uh, had to reach such a, uh, a horrible, ending. One could argue that because he was killed, on the, uh, in great part because of his belief in modernity, uh, it really made the country realize that that's what you had to do. In other words, he was sort of a martyr to the cause of the future. The nation went into mourning. With this assassination, the question came far sooner than anyone expected. Who would take the reins of this emerging global powerhouse? With the assassination of King Faisal, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia suffered another crisis of leadership. The royal family quickly chose a successor, an uncontroversial and little-known prince named Khalid. 
he became king as a sort of a compromise candidate because a lot of people thought Fahad was the de facto strong man at the time, even under King Faisal, because Fahad was sort of the main advisor to King Faisal. But Fahad, because of his uh, reputation as a playboy and whatnot, did not always have the support of the rest of the family. So Khaled, who was thought by many people as not wanting to be king at all, sort of was made king as a peacemaker, as an in interim uh, personality until things could be sorted out. Khaled was more of a caretaker king, unlike Faisal, who was always busy running a government. Khaled was much more comfortable in the tribal environment. He was the least remembered person in, in all of these people. He did nothing. He was not interested in being a king. Uh, he spent most of his time out in the desert. King Khaled loved sitting in the desert. He loved his hawks. But as he got older, um, he wasn't so mobile. And so he had um, a sofa put into the back of an um, all-terrain vehicle and would go out hunting in that. During the reign of the caretaker king, there were major shifts in the Muslim world. In 1979, militant fundamentalists took over the mosque in Mecca. Saudi forces killed over 100 people. Taking over Mecca was truly for them a wake-up call. This cannot continue solving problems like this. The Saudis, remarkably, by the way, for a Middle Eastern country, backed away from violence. Just one month later, Afghanistan was invaded by the Soviet army. To the Wahhabi clerics, who were the royal family's partners, this was an unacceptable presence in the region. The Soviet Union was seen as godless. It was godless. And therefore, a direct threat, not just to Afghanistan, but to the whole Muslim community. In Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia was the full partner of the United States. We both agreed the best thing to do was just hand out arms and money. Saudi nationals went in droves to fight the Soviets, including a young Osama bin Laden. It was very successful for the, the Saudis and, and successful for us. The, Saudi, the, the Soviets were defeated. And uh, all these young Mujahideen uh, uh, paid and trained uh, by the Saudis and to some degree paid and trained by us uh, were also victorious. But uh, actions have consequences. Khalid suffered a heart attack in 1982. He died just seven years into his reign. Khalid's legacy, the Saudi involvement in Afghanistan, would have major repercussions in years to come. How do you reintegrate uh, young warriors when they come back uh, victorious from a war? They looked and they saw instead of a country ruled by shepherd kings, uh, uh, living austere Muslim lives, they saw a country that was run by and for the benefit of the royal family. And uh, where there was a gap between what the royal family said and what it actually did. With Khalid's death, the crown prince Fahad became king. By reputation, he seemed the opposite of the austere Muslim that the Wahhabist populace expected of their leader. Word had it that he had once lost six million dollars in a single night in Monte Carlo. He owned yachts, an estate in Spain. Even Fahad's weight was seen as a symbol of royal decadence. The king's weight would balloon up into, you know, well over 200 pounds and perhaps a good deal closer to 300 pounds. And then he would go on these crash dives. But pretty soon you'd see him. And even in the flattering, concealing garments that uh, Saudis wore, you could tell that there was a lot of king there beneath these garments. I think it added to the way people saw him as someone who was not as self-disciplined and uh, with the same inner checks that uh, someone like uh, Faisal uh, so totally had. The entire family came under scrutiny. One prince, Al-Walid bin Salal, was said to be worth nearly $20 billion before his stake in Citigroup plummeted during the bank crisis of 2008 and 2009. In one of his opulent homes, Al-Walid had 17 dining rooms, 12 elevators, and a private screening room. Hardly the Spartan life of Wahhabist Islam, 
which shuns anything developed past the 7th century. Rather than reigning in the royal family, he more or less just let them run wild. I think Fahad really was breaking the commitment to what I might call social justice in Saudi Arabia and allowing the elites to amass great wealth. They were very much nouveau riche at the time. I and mean, all of a sudden, that this big mana coming from heaven, and you know, they were spending it like crazy. I mean, it was very much fun. And then they realized that there's a lot of drawback to that. Also, King Fahad was uh, really was seen by the religious establishment as being too wild. And so when he became king, he had to make up for that. Even as the royals reaped their percentage of the oil profits, unemployment within the kingdom soared. You had this uh, population explosion, more and more people who were needing education and, and needing health service and needing housing and needing jobs. And the Saudis just were not uh, producing the jobs that they needed in order to keep the uh, population, you know, satisfied. The discontented masses, trained in madrasa schools and funded by the Saudi government, were about to add another grievance. International forces, non-Muslim soldiers, were about to be stationed on their holy soil at the invitation of the royal family. In 1990, Iraq's Saddam Hussein ordered the invasion of Kuwait. An international coalition was poised to take Kuwait back. King Fahad, fearing that his kingdom was also in Saddam's sights, agreed to station foreign troops on Saudi soil. Saudis had always had a real fear and resentment of an American military presence in Saudi Arabia for two reasons. One, they are xenophobic, and the idea of armed foreigners in the country was very disquieting to them. Another thing that, that was of grave concern to them was that they consider Saudi Arabia to be sacred soil because it is the place where Mecca and Medina are. As if to counter the criticisms, Fahad to fund the religious right. He allowed the conservatives to take over society. And under the, the years of King Fahad, society became very, very closed. Women were not allowed to work when they were allowed to work before. Of course, they still are not allowed to drive. Um, you know, foreigners were really kept aside, etc., etc. And uh, they gave a lot of money to movements outside, uh, proselytizing movements outside Saudi Arabia to push this, this conservative Wahhabi trend. And so the religious right was always reluctant to attack the royal family. I mean, they were the financiers. But the efforts didn't silence the most radical elements, especially since 5,000 American troops remained after the first Gulf War, a fact that made the top of Osama bin Laden's list of grievances. He uses the American presence to recruit some of these religious extremists who are trained in Saudi universities to literally hate non-Muslims. And look who is supporting the Saudi royal family. The infidels are supporting them, who happens to be having bases in our country. In November 1995, angry rhetoric turned to violence. A U.S.-run training facility in Riyadh was bombed killing five Americans and two citizens of India. King Fahad claimed to have found and executed the guilty terrorists, but U.S. law enforcement agents complained that they had never been given access to the investigations. From our point of view here, of course, we viewed it as the killing of U.S. servicemen, and therefore we wanted to be involved. But from the Saudis, it was on their territory, and they were going to lead the operation, and they were going to manage the, uh, how it was investigated. The following year, terrorists drove a truck with 5,000 pounds of explosives into an international complex called the Kobar Towers. Nineteen Americans were killed, 
and nearly 400 people of various nationalities were injured. This was a strike at the royal family, bring it down. Um, and I think it was vulnerable. And then, the events of September 11, 2001. 15 of the 19 attackers were Saudi nationals. The alleged mastermind, Osama bin Laden, was also from Saudi Arabia. People around the world started to focus on the royal family and their relationship with the hardline Wahhabi branch of Islam. This was never planned by the Saudi royal family, but they allowed the Wahhabis to spend their money in places like Pakistan, and this is the result we're getting. Victims' families alleged that key Saudi figures funded al-Qaeda, including Prince Sultan, the defense minister, and Prince Turki al-Faisal, the ambassador to Great Britain at the time. Although we cannot prove that high-ranking Saudi officials committed this atrocity, we know for a certainty that they were the terrorists' travel agents who delivered them well-fed, well-trained, and well-equipped to the World Trade Center that day. Most of these allegations were dropped by 2005, but damage had been done. The Saudi monarchs threatened to divest of key investments in the United States. During this period, Fahad suffered a debilitating stroke, and Crown Prince Abdullah took responsibility for day-to-day -day operations. It was an excruciating period for the Saudis because they didn't know who was in control. So you had a huge power vacuum. Rumors swirled that Fahad's prominent full brothers, known as the Sudari Seven, weren't ready to give up power. The Sudari Seven are, they had a single mother from Sudair. It was the favorite wife of Abdulaziz, the founder of Saudi Arabia. And they had seven boys out of this relationship. Um, who were all very capable, politically well-connected, and have run the key ministries, key industries in Saudi Arabia. And they act as a faction. There were even whispers that Fahad was being kept on artificial life support to prevent Abdullah from taking the throne. In these inner circles of the royal family, no one knows how decisions are made. No one knows why they're being made. and. Uh, I don't, I don't know whether that was, it's a possibility, I don't know whether that was the fact or not. I think it's, it's really what I would call a rumor. But of course in the Middle East, rumor is news, you know. <laughs> Inside and outside Saudi Arabia, some worried that the crisis of leadership could mean the end of the kingdom. Saudi Arabia in 2003 and 2004 was on the brink of an insurrection, a Wahhabi insurrection. In 2005, King Fahad died after being seriously ill for 10 years. The crown prince, Abdullah, became king. You know, he's supposed to be a very simple man, as simple as a man worth billions of dollars can ever be, you know. Uh, but he's supposed to be able to talk to the people and to speak very straight to the people. And uh, in fact, he's been criticized in some circles for not being diplomatic. <laughs> He says it the way it is, he knows he's very old, he's got to achieve things and he will not waste his time on people, uh, you know, being gentle and nice. He just tells him straight. We always knew all along that he was going to be a much more, um, what could I say, more responsible leader is not the word. He's not particularly pro-American. I mean, he personally despised the Bush administration, held it responsible for the war in Iraq. Relations between the Saudi royal family and the United Kingdom also hit a rough patch. That country's serious fraud office investigated a scheme in which Prince Bandar, son of Saudi Arabia's defense minister, took massive bribes from the arms manufacturer BAE Systems. It was very well known in the kingdom uh, that the BAE uh, contracts had been subject to probably some kind of um, understandings on how the payments were made. And what I did not realize is that there would be $2 million a month passed on by BAE to Prince Bandar in Washington. Things went from bad to worse when Prime Minister Tony Blair called for the investigation to be halted. 
I don't believe the investigation incidentally would have led anywhere except to the complete wreckage of a vital strategic relationship for our country. The Prime Minister of Great Britain compromised his country's judicial system, democratic values and tradition because of threats from the Saudi ruling family. That's, that's a very dangerous uh, precedence. As king, Abdullah could finally roll out more of the reforms that he promised. But change can happen slowly in the Middle East. The real point is management inside the country. And, and you know, frankly, I didn't think this was going to be this smooth. Saudi Arabia is stepping into the 21st century. Slowly, but it's coming in. Because he believes that the kingdom will only reach its uh, potential if it's allowed to develop economically, and that means really moving away from the conservative religious establishment. Abdullah has also started to carry out his goal to loosen ties to the West. He tried also very hard to go east to China and to India and have arm deals and arm sales with these people in cooperation. And he felt comfortable with that. And he used that actually as a blackmailing uh, instrument against the West. You know, we, we are not the only boys and girls in town. I mean, China and India, their economies, they will use our oil. We could get arms from them, we could services, so we don't need you as much as we do. Whatever his reputation, Abdullah seemed to hold particular sway with the product of another oil family, President George W. Bush. The, the big image we have of this is saying is when Abdullah went to Crawford, Texas, and talked to the president and walked with the president around the compound there. And that meeting in Crawford was very important for the Saudis. Not so much for the war in Iraq, which there was always disagreement and we were, they'll never agree with us on anything on that. But one of the big decisions that were taking at Crawford, which didn't make headlines at the time, was the fact that the king was able to convince the president to allow Saudi Arabia into the WTO against a lot of the objections of the Europeans. Today, Abdullah is pushing to diversify, making the kingdom less dependent on one resource. If the price of oil stays down below $30 for a long period of time, Saudi Arabia will once again face existential problems, as will the rest of the Gulf. So they're, they're spending an enormous amount of money on education to bring more research, more dependence on science. They are spending an enormous amount of money on creating factories that will use their energy, of course, because that's what they have, that's cheap, but in a way that instead of selling it for $40 a barrel, that after the value added and the work and so on, they will sell ultimately for $500 a barrel. Abdullah is the right man at the right time. He has maintained his ties to the, to the traditionalists, he is very well respected by all Saudis as being uh, pious, uncorrupted. And he knows it's going to take a generation, at least, to change the educational system. But he knows if you don't start now, you'll never get anywhere and the kingdom will stay as a second-rate power forever. In February 2009, King Abdullah shocked the world. He announced that he was dismissing ultra-conservatives from top posts and made other changes. And we've seen with the appointment of a female minister, deputy minister. I mean, this is, this is all fantastic news for Saudi Arabia. This is a vibrant society. It has its problems, like all societies in the world, but it is not a failed society. It is experiencing growing pains, but it is a society that will certainly endure. If Abdullah's strategies work, the House of Saud will also endure, but the king is in his 80s. By 2009, Crown Prince Sultan was reportedly already terminally ill. Plus, the rest of the sons of the founding king are also of advanced age. The succession process is anything but a sure thing. Soon, a grandson, or even a great-grandson, of the founding king will have to be chosen. And we, we don't know who's going to be next, but he has made it in such a way that whoever comes next will be very close to his views of where it should go. Many of them, the grandsons, are educated people. Uh, 
very detached from the past. I mean, from the Bedouin traditions like King Abdullah and his brothers. They grew up in semi-nomadic life and, you know, like to the sword dance and go to the desert and hunt. These new generations grow up like many other generations with computers and, and, and you know, public universities in, in the West and other places. So their value system has changed too. So there might be some, uh, might be some positive changes in terms of spreading power a little bit, okay? But it will be a very interesting thing to see. In just a matter of decades, the Saudi royal family has presided over a nation's transition from a tribal society to a major player on the world stage. Despite all the internal and international turmoil, the House of Saud has retained its power. Well, as the Saudis like to say, they're like a fist.